Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining the HHS SBIR Contract RFP Informational Webinar. My name is Betty Royster and I will be your moderator today. If time permits, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So please submit the questions in the questions box in your webinar console. And we're only planning to answer general questions about the contract and electronic submission. We will not be answering questions specific to contract topics. So any sort of specific or technical contract topic question you have, please send that to the con contracting officer who will compile these questions and post the Q&A amendment to the HHS SBIR contract proposal. And also, these slides and a recording will be available after the webinar. And we will be posting that on our website of sbir.nih.gov. And Dr. Matthew Portnoy will begin the presentation, who, and he is the HHS, SBIR, and STTR program coordinator. So with that, take it away, Matt. Thank you very much, Betty. Welcome, everyone, to the HHS SBIR Contract RFP Informational Webinar for our recently issued contract solicitation, PHS 2016-1. My name is Matt Portnoy, and I'm your host for today. I'm the NIH SBIR STTR Program Coordinator. Today, we will cover these topics on the agenda about the contract solicitation and you will hear from myself and contracts and technical staff at the NIH and CDC institutes and centers. We'll begin with an overview, uh, a short overview of the SBIR program with details about the contract RFP or request for proposal. We'll discuss differences from this and the HHS SBIR grant program. We'll discuss the deadlines for submitting your questions um, and, and, and where we'll be posting the answers and the deadline for your receipt of your proposals. We'll be discussing the new electronic proposal submission process we have put in place this year with the system called ECPS. And finally, we'll be having the institutes and CDC present an overview of their contract topics. Please note that two of our institutes on the solicitation, NIAAA, National Institute for Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, will not have any slides today. They do have topics listed in the solicitation, which you will find in Section 12, and you can feel free to contact the contracting officer for those and any of the other topics that you wish to ask questions for. So in overview, the SBIR STTR program is a trans-government program whereby 11 federal agencies set aside a portion of their budget to support small business innovation research and small business technology transfer research grants and contracts. HHS is the second largest agency in the SBIR program, and in fiscal 13, nearly $700 million went to this program. Within HHS, there are five components that have an SBIR program, of two of which are on the contract RFP. You can see that NIH, for the current fiscal year, has an SBIR budget of $691 million, and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have an SBIR budget of $7 million. The other components of HHS, ACL, FDA, and ACF, have SBIR programs but are not on this contract solicitation. You can, you can apply to those agencies through our Omnibus grant solicitation. Very briefly, the SBIR program is a three-phase program, whereby phase one is a short feasibility study of six months to one year in length for around $150,000 in total costs. Phase two is a full R&D effort over two years, typically for $1 million. NIH has a second phase two called phase 2B that continues the phase two work. That is not subject to the contract RFP. And phase three is the commercialization stage whereby the work is continued without SBR STTR funds. Please keep in mind that NIH and CDC are generally not going to be the customer 
of your technology at the end of the day. And so you want to uh, consider partnering and your exit strategy early from the program and where you might receive your next infusion of funds to continue the commercialization work. All information about the HHS SBIR program can be found at our website, sbir.nih.gov. Here you will find information about uh, the program, our funding opportunities, how to apply, our peer review process, policy, and other resources available to you. In addition, the contract solicitation that I'll talk about uh, shortly can be found readily on this website under the funding page. As I alluded to earlier, this webinar is about our contract solicitation. We do, as you probably know, have a large grant program, approximately 90 to 95 percent of the HHS SBR budget is in the form of grants. And our omnibus grant solicitations at the top of the page, PA15269 and PA15270, are open and available for grant submissions. The next available due date is September 5th which I'll remind folks interested in grants, is a Saturday. Monday the 7th is Labor Day, so the due date is actually September 8th for grant submissions. And we'll be talking shortly about the differences between grants and contracts. But the subject of this webinar is the SBR contract solicitation with NIH and CDC. We released that solicitation on July 24th, and I'll reiterate this uh, several times, has a close date of October 16th. If you wish, to stay in touch on the solicitations we issue, whether it be SBR contracts or grants or any NIH solicitation, whether for or not small businesses, please subscribe to the weekly NIH Guide for Grants and Contracts email shown here. The HHS SBR contract RFP and material can be found in three places. First, you can find it on the main NIH SBIR website at sbir.nih.gov slash funding hashtag phase one, or just slash funding. It's at the bottom, and you can see here a link to the PDF of the RFP and a Word document of the RFP. If you click the button at the bottom that says contract proposal forms, that will take you to this page, which is on the more general NIH grants page. Again, on the left, you can see a reposting of the PDF and Word document of the actual RFP. And on the right are the contract appendix forms that you are required to submit with your submission. Phase one has three appendices, A, B, C. And at the bottom, there are three appendices, uh, there are uh, six appendices for phase two and fast track proposals with links to the PDF and Word document. The links to these are also at the back of the solicitation in the appendix section. The third place you can find the RFP is in the federal-wide contract portal FedBizOps. The URL is at the top. It's obviously too complicated to read, but this is linked to on our website and through the policy notice we issued for it. Here you will find a link to the full RFP as well. This is the first cover page of the RFP of what it looks like for PHS 2016-1. Uh, if you see something different, you may have opened the wrong file, and please go back um, and uh, try again. And if you have trouble finding the solicitation, also please email us, and we will help you out. The solicitation is laid out as, followed in, as follows in 12 sections. I'll be referring to these sections throughout the rest of the talk to find key information uh, for you. Uh, of particular note is section 10, where all of the contacts for the contracting officer are, and section 12, which is a full detailed listing of all the topics available for submission. Of course, all the sections are important. The number one piece of advice that I and we at NIH and CDC can give you is to please read the entire RFP several times. This will give you the full background of the program, what you need to do, and the topic uh, definitions and, what, and how you submit. And this really will help you quite a long way. And now I'm going to go through various portions of the RFP that are of note. 
We won't have time in this webinar to go through the full RFP page by page, of course, but these are the highlights that are of most importance to highlight to you. Section 2.6 highlights the parts of NIH and CDC that are participating in this contract solicitation. Uh, please note, unlike the omnibus grant solicitation where all the NIH institutes participate and many CDC uh, centers and, and, and institutes do, a small number of institutes and a portion of CDC participate in the contract solicitation. And it changes from year to year. So um, it's important that you read the current solicitation. This year, in NIH, we have the National Cancer Institute, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse for NIH. Within CDC, we have the Center for Global Health, the National Center for Emerging Zoonotic and Infectious Diseases, the National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD and TB Prevention, and the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Within the solicitation, you will find links to each of these parts of the agency and their missions. We will accept several types of SBR proposals under the solicitation. This is summarized in a table in section one of the solicitation and reiterated within each reiterated within each topic listed in section 12. Uh, a, a short synopsis of table one is shown here. We will accept three types of proposals. The vast majority of topics, but not all, uh, will accept a phase one proposal um, whereby you just submit a phase one. A smaller number of topics will also accept a fast track proposal whereby you submit a complete phase one proposal and a complete phase two proposal. And finally, a certain number of topics will, will accept a direct phase two proposal, um, which it does not include a phase one proposal. And this table lists the topic and what types of uh, proposals are accepted per topic. And as you can see in this table, some topics accept more than one type of proposal. If you have questions on this, certainly contact the contracting officer listed in Section 10. Briefly, I'm going to go over what constitutes a complete Phase 1 and 2 submission, but there is much more detail in the RFP. For Phase 1, this can be found in Section 8.3 of the proposal. All, propo all complete submissions consist of two parts, the technical proposal in its own single PDF and the business proposal in its own single PDF. The technical proposal includes um, the proposal cover sheet, Appendix A, a table of contents, which you will generate, the abstract of the research plan, Appendix B, and the content of the technical element. The content of the technical element is the meat of your proposal and will include all of the aspects um, of what is required to uh, tell us about your research and the, pro uh, the product, et cetera. And there are full instructions within the RFP on what constitutes the technical element. The business proposal is essentially the budget. Uh, it includes the pricing proposal, which is Appendix C, but also includes other various forms we require, such as the SBIR application, venture capital operating company certification, if your company is majority owned by venture capital companies, if applicable to you. And for all offerers, the Item four, the proof of registration in the SBA company registry. This is the half page sheet you get from the SBIR.gov website. And these two uh, essentially parts constitute a phase one submission. A phase two submission uh, can be found in section 8.4 for a full description and includes, again, a technical proposal in the single PDF and a business proposal in its own PDF. Technical proposal includes the cover sheet, Appendix D. Note it's a different cover sheet for the Phase 1 and Phase 2. A table of contents you generate. The abstract, which is the same Appendix B. Content of the technical element, which again is the meat of the proposal and will take up the most amount of space. Draft, statement of work, <coughs> Appendix E. And the summary of related activities, Appendix X, F. Excuse me. Also in phase two, a business proposal is required and constitutes the same parts as in a phase one proposal. The pricing proposal, Appendix C, 
the VC form if applicable, and the proof of registry in the SBA company registry. If your project is working with either human subjects or vertebrate animal work, this slide is highlighting the sections of the RFP that are relevant to you. And of course, you should read the whole, um, the whole RFP, but if you're working with human subjects or vertebrate animal work, Section 3 will provide definitions for these. Section 4.9, 4.10, and 4.11 will have a description of what constitutes research in these areas. And sections 8.9, 8.10, 8.11, and 8.12 contain detailed instructions of what you are to include in your proposal in these areas if you are doing work in those areas. And so uh, definitely pay attention to all of these, but especially section 8 for instructions. Page limits for the proposals are found in section 7.3. Phase 1 technical proposal, meaning all of item 1 in that PDF, shall not exceed 50 pages in total for all parts. Phase 2, item 1, shall not exceed 150 pages. This does not include the business proposal or your budget. If you're familiar with grants, you will note this is very different. Um, the grant um, page limits are, are much smaller, but that is just for the research strategy. This is specific for the contracts, and also note we don't dictate what size your technical element needs to be for description of the work, but in total you need to fit your phase one within 50 pages and phase two within 150. <coughs> Excuse me. A fast track, if you're submitting one, is a complete phase one plus a complete phase two proposal submitted separately, and we will show you how to do that. Therefore, it's 50 plus 150 in, in their own PDFs each with their own separate budget uh, pri uh, pricing proposal. The, and section 7.3 describes all of this, uh, single sided, single space for the entire proposal, and it's all inclusive, including all the pages, cover sheet, tables, CVs, resumes, references, all of your graphics, um, appendices, enclosures, etc. And there is no exclusion on the page limits to the technical proposal. Any proposal that comes in in excess the additional pages will be clipped off the proposal and will not be considered. That concludes the overview section, and now I'm going to briefly discuss the differences between what we just discussed and SBR grants. And if you're familiar with the grant program, most of everything you just saw probably seemed very different. And so on the left are contracts, and on the right are grants. Contracts are an acquisition mechanism for agencies. Grants are an assistance mechanism. In, con in SBR contracts, NIH and CDC are acquiring the R&D from your company. And that's not to be confused with acquiring the technology or buying the product. We are acquiring the R&D. A grant is an assistance mechanism. Contracts follows the Federal Acquisition Regulations, or FAR, and the SBR Policy Directive. Grants follow NIH Grants Policy and the SBR Policy Directive. Contracts are not investigator initiated, and grants are. If you apply to our grant omnibus, as you know, you can apply for any topic that we have listed in our topics document or anything that fits within the mission of NIH. For this contract RFP, you must respond exactly to one of the topics or more um, that we have listed and, and meet the criteria uh, expressly. As such, contract SBR topics tend to have narrow very well-defined topics with deliverables listed to deliver to the government. Grants can have broad or narrow topics depending, but there are typically not going to be deliverables. The lingo is different between contracts and grants. In contracts, the solicitation is called an RFP, Request for Proposal. In grants, it's called a Program Announcement, PA, PIR, or an RFA, Request for Applications. The, in contracts, you are the offerer. In grants, you are the applicant. In, if you get an award, you are a contractor under contracts and a grantee under grants. And finally, you submit to us a proposal in a contract and you submit an application to us under grants. Contacting the agency is very different in contract in, in grants. Under this contract solicitation, your only contact allowed is with the contracting officer listed in Section 10. 
<coughs> you uh, cannot contact the program officer about the contract solicitation. If you do, they will direct you to speak to the contracting officer. And this is because under the FAR for fair and open competition. Under grants, you can contract the program officer at any time for anything. Additionally, different systems are involved. This year, we have a new electronic uh, contract submission system, which I, I think and hope you will find very easy and intuitive to use, called eCPS. Our contract submissions used to be on paper. With grants, we have um, lingo you're familiar with, the SF424, grants.gov, and ERA Commons. What types of things do you need to use on the contract? Do you need to register in the SBIR company registry at the SBA? Yes, you do. All offerers must and provide this in their proposal. Do you have to submit a venture capital certification? Yes, if applicable to your company. Do you need a DUNS number? Yes, you have to have your business formed in order to apply. Do you need to be registered in SAM, the System for Award Management? Yes, but in contracts at time of award. In grants, it needs to be at time of submission. Do you need to register in grants.gov to submit a contract proposal? No. Do you need to register in ERA Commons to submit a contract proposal? No. However, if you have an ERA Commons account, you can use this to register and submit in the ECPS system, which you'll see in a moment. And finally, do you have to use the Electronic Contract Proposal Submission System, ECPS? Yes. This is a uh, a system that's been around for a few years, but it's new to HHS SBIR. This is required to submit all proposals under the contract solicitation. Now we'll discuss deadlines. I want to remind everyone that your only contact with this contract solicitation is with the contracting officer listed in Section 10. There are email and or phone numbers listed for all the com awarding components. You must submit your questions in writing email to the contracting officer. The deadline for receipt of questions to the contracting officer is next week, August 21st, August 21st, 2015, close of business. We will collectively compile all of your questions and compile answers and issue in a few weeks, early to mid-September, um, at least a month before the deadline, um, a question and answer amendment to the solicitation that will be posted both in FedBizOps and on the NIH SBR website. So what this means, and you may not be accustomed to, is yes, your questions and the answers that are provided will be posted for all to see to the public to ensure a fair and open competition. Questions of a very technical nature about a specific topic and about your technology may not be able to be answered uh, due to this. But general questions will all be posted for all to see. After this deadline, additional questions you submit to the contracting officer may be answered at their discretion. They will certainly direct you to the amendment, and they may answer at their discretion. And the big one, the deadline for receipt of all proposals is Friday, October 16, 2015, 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And we'll go into the system in a little bit about that. Electronic submission must be complete by this time, not started. So you'll need to have, you definitely want to have the confirmation um, time stamp on your submissions by 5 p.m. The system will shut down after that and you will not be able to submit. And I remind again, no paper submissions. We will not accept mail, uh, FedEx or mail submissions. They will be uh, rejected without review. Now we will um, go to discuss the new electronic proposal submission process we have with the eCPS system. Um, and I know I am reiterating this over and over, but it's important. It's a big change um, for uh, HHS contract submissions. Electronic submission is now required of all proposals. Paper proposals will not be accepted. Section 7.4 of the solicitation entitled Submission modifications, revision, and withdrawal of proposals contains the website and detailed instructions on how to submit your proposal to the NIH and CDC. The website for eCPS is listed here. It is also listed in the solicitation in Section 7.4. I will now turn the webinar over 
to Mike Kepsilis at the on the eCPS team to do a live demo of the eCPS process for registration, submission, and revision of electronic proposals. At this time, uh, please don't click on this link and go to the website. You'll be able to do that afterwards. We're going to do a live demo. So Betty, uh, please turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Betty. This is Mike Capsillus, and I'm going to give you an overview of the electronic contract proposal submission system. Again, as Matt said, this is for submission of contract proposals, not grant applications. If you need information on grant applications, you would click on the SBIR website. This is the landing page for the ECPS, and as you can see, there are uh, three main sections to it. The first being the registration section, and I'll show you how to go ahead and log in. I want to stress now that it's important to register as soon as possible. Uh, as a matter of fact, maybe after the webinar today, uh, we highly recommend you go in and register. It's a very quick process. If you already have an ERA Commons account, you can log in with your ERA Commons. If you need to initiate a new registration, you would do it through NIH EXT, and that's through clicking here, and it's a very brief registration document to initiate uh, a new account. We turn them over as quickly as possible. We do definitely within three days. We highly recommend you do not wait within the three days of closing because we cannot guarantee um, the registration will be accepted. So that's why we highly recommend you go in and register now as soon as possible. On the right-hand side, you'll see some frequently asked questions. If you click on any of these, it will take you to more details, and you can also access the FAQs at the top of the website. Towards the bottom of the ECPS site, you're going to see the, the listing of all topics for this particular solicitation. If you click on the solicitation, it will take you to the solicitation in FedBizOps. As you scroll down, you'll see every uh, topic by topic title and the points of contact and the awarding component for each topic. This is very important to when you go to upload to make sure that you upload your proposals against the proposal against the correct topic. I have not yet logged in and I'm going to go ahead and log in and show you what it looks like after you log in, after you um, initiate an account request and get your login and after you log in. So these are as you can see all topics for the SBIR solicitation. I'm going to go ahead and log in now. Once you log in, it takes you to a screen that shows all active topics under the solicitation. And the one change you'll see now is you have a submit button on the right hand side. I have initiated some test submissions, and if I'm scrolling down to some topics that we have that I already submitted on, I'm going to go ahead and submit a fast track proposal, uh, uh, phase one and phase two, against topic 37. As you can see, because I have already submitted some test proposals, I have several options here. And, I'll, sh and I'll, I'll show you more details regarding those options in a moment. So if I submit against topic 37, I'll hit the submit button. <coughs> it's a good idea to verify one more time that you're submitting and gets the right topic here. 
and you'll see the topic title. This is where you enter a proposal name, and this is the proposal name that you enter in ECPS. And you'll see in your, in your, in your um, solicitation there's naming conventions, and we also have the naming conventions in the FAQ. And, um, and I will show you after the online demo, I'll show you three slides that also discuss the naming conventions for the proposal names. So what we do ask for is that you enter the phase. And in this case, we're going to do a fast track proposal. The concept is the same if you were just doing a phase one or the one topic that allows for a phase two, you would just not enter fast track here. So for a fast track phase one, we name it this way. You name the phase, fast track, the name of your company, the, the awarding component, and the topic number. And then down below, you're giving some, given some options here. You upload a technical and a business proposal. You have the option to upload an Excel spreadsheet of your costs. Uh, if you do, that must be identical to the cost that you have uh, entered in your business proposal. It is an option though, so you do not need to enter that Excel spreadsheet. So I'm going to go ahead and enter my technical proposal and the business proposal. As you can see here, and in the, in the solicitation it also asks that you label these accordingly. So you have the naming convention in the ECPS header here, and then you also have the naming conventions that we asked for on the actual document level. Here's my technical and here's my business proposal. And again, you have the option to upload the Excel document. I would hit submit here. So once you hit submit, you're going to see a message here. This is verification that the upload was successful. You can also, and I'll show you in a minute, you can also access um, verification that the upload was successful through my submission history. Now, because we've uploaded these, we are given the option to update if you want to change any of these documents. Up until the closing date and time, you can change these. You can upload a new doc, a new technical, and a new business, it will completely overwrite the old one. It will replace it. You're given this option, of course, up until the closing date and time. We now have the option to submit our phase two fast track proposal. We can do it at several places. One place we can do it is here. If you back out into my submission history, you're also going to see, you're also going to see new, submit new alternate proposal. And I'll show you that in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and submit it from here. There's a message that comes up that says, are you sure you want to submit a new slash alternate proposal, in this case a, a phase two fast track? It's a, um, it's a verification message in case you accidentally hit this and actually want to revise your current proposal. If you, in fact, want to revise your current proposal, you would cancel out of this and hit update proposal, I'm sorry, and hit replace file, revise accordingly, and then hit update proposal. Because we want to do a phase two fast track, we would hit submit new alternate, click OK, and where it takes us back to the same type of window. In this case, we're going to submit a phase two fast track. Again, you put fast track, you put your company name, the awarding component, and the topic number. And you would select your technical and business proposals. And hit submit. And you'll have a message regarding the uh, the receipt of the proposals. When you now back, and here's a history log of your actions taken, when you now back out into the previous view, 
This is the table view with all of the topics. When you scroll down, you will see the one that we had just submitted to topic 37. And again, you're given the option to revise and to and to uh, submit a new alternate proposal. In this case, you finished your two phase for fast track. If you need to revise, again, you can go in through here. When you hit revise submission, you're going to get a listing of, of all the submissions. In, in my case, there is a long list because I've submitted some tests here. But when you go down to phase uh, topic 37, again, you're given the option to revise. So phase one has the technical and the business, and phase two has the technical and the business proposal. If you hit revise, it takes you back to that screen that we've seen, and you can revise or you can replace either the technical and business accordingly. That is it for the submission of contracts against uh, using the ECPS. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add, if you submit the wrong, if you submit proposal against the wrong topic accidentally, go ahead and submit against the correct topic and then notify the point of contact, the contracting officer, contract specialist with, with the wrong topic and uh, they will take care of it. You cannot do this inside the system. You cannot delete a proposal submission uh, against the wrong topic. The priority then is to submit, like I said, against the correct topic and then notify the, the point of contact for the incorrect topic. Thank you. Matt, this is completes the ECPS session. Thank you, Mike. Please keep the screen up for a minute, Betty. Oh, Betty, can you please uh, go back to Mike? Just uh, send it back to Mike for one second. So I want to uh, draw your attention to two things. Um, as you saw in bright yellow, there is the countdown clock on each and every one of these topics. The countdown clock is identical. It is the same deadline for each of the topics. This counts down to 5 p.m. on October 16th. After 5 p.m. on October 16th, the submit button will not be available to you. Um, and then if you click one more time, uh, Mike right there. And then on this screen also, the, at the, there's a countdown clock and at the bottom there is the submit proposal and that will not be active. Your proposals must be submitted and you must get the confirmation screen by or before 5 p.m. for any and all of your proposal submissions, especially if you're submitting more than one. As you can see, it's pretty simple to submit. It's basically a title, two documents, and hit submit. Section 7 also describes the late policy. This is very, very different than the grant late policy. This is essentially a zero tolerance late policy, as it is for all contract submissions, by and large, to the federal government. Your submissions must be complete and uh, by 5 p.m. We will not accept late submissions for any reason. If, however, the eCPS system itself goes down, then, of course, we will make an accommodation for the length of time that eCPS is down. But absent the eCPS system going down, there is no late submission after the deadline. And so please, Matt? please, please submit um, before the deadline for any and all of your proposal submissions. Thank you, Matt. And I wanted to add, so your submission must, like you said, your submission must be complete. You must get that verification, the congratulations message. You can't have the window open. Uh, if the time passes, if that time passes, it will not allow you to hit submit. Right, and you're able to print the confirmation screen, the congratulations screen for your records also. All also, right. So you cannot see the proposals once you submit them. You can only see the receipt. You can see the fact that you submitted proposals and you can see the document name, but you cannot see the actual proposals. So if you do have a change and you have an updated proposal, we, you would go in and you would hit uh, update and you would replace it with your new proposal. 
All right, great. Thank you very much, Mike. All right, Betty, I'll take back control now. All right, so that was a live demo. Um, and now Mike's going to uh, continue to discuss the proposal naming format in more detail. Thank you, Matt. So this is um, basically just going through what we have just done on the, on the online system. The, the proposal name here is the proposal name in the ECPS field, not on the document file level. So this is the proposal name that we request that you put the phase. Um, if it's a fast track, you would then put fast track. You put the name of the, uh, your company name. You put the NIH or CDC awarding component and then the topic just like we did in the, in the, on the online system. Um, next slide, please. This is on the actual file level. So when you save your business and technical proposals to your local drive, this is what we recommend. This is what we request that you name them. So you would have your, op, your name, NIH or CDC awarding component, topic being proposed under, and of course, the type of proposal, then it would be the extension of the actual application. So you'd have your company, your topic, technical, your company, your topic, business proposal, and X and Excel if you had the the, the uh, spreadsheet. Next slide. So this is kind of a, a visual of what we did for fast track. You would enter your phase one fast track name in ECPS. You would up upload your technical and business proposals for your phase one, you would hit submit, you would hit alternate proposal, you would then uh, name your phase two fast track, upload technical and business for phase two, and hit submit. Great. Uh, thank you, Mike. And if Thanks. you are submitting a phase one only, of course, you just do steps one and two, and you remove fast track from the title. If you are submitting a direct phase two, you just do the last two steps, steps four and five, and omit the uh, fast track uh, language. And so um, it should be hopefully relatively simple and, and intuitive for you to use. And we're um, glad we're able to offer it to you uh, finally. So moving on, we will now go uh, to each of the institutes um, that have topics, um, with the exception of NIAAA and NIDA, and the CDC, and to, for them to give a brief overview of their topics, and then we'll use the remaining time for any questions and answers. A reminder, if you're interested in NIAAA or NIDA topics, they have them, and they are listed in the solicitation in Section 12, and, and you'll be able to find everything you need there. As will all of the institutes and centers will have full, detailed descriptions of all of the topics. And now I'm going to turn it over to Patty Weber and uh, Johnny Franco uh, from the NCI to discuss the NCI topics. Thank you, Matt. Um, so this slide just shows you a quick link to NCI-specific contract opportunities at sbir.cancer.gov slash funding slash contracts. Next slide. So this year, um, on this table, you've already seen some of what uh, Matt showed you, but this basically um, just defines the differences, again, between grants and contracts. So the scope is defined by the NIH. Now at NCI, we have specific review at the NCI. So, so we uh, strive to get about 50% of the reviewers from the business community. And as Matt mentioned, the program staff in, involvement, um, once a contract is awarded, is, is very high. Next slide, please. So um, again, this just summarizes uh, the opportunity that we have, this receipt date of October 16th. Again, you can find the full RFP at the link shown here, and more about NCI's specific topic areas at our link at sbir.cancer.gov. So I'm going to go into the contract topics. The next slide, we have 14 contract topics this year, covering a variety of areas. I'm going to show um, the first up to topic 348, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Johnny Franco, and he'll go through the rest with you. So this first topic is entitled, it's 341, it's development of metabolomics 
data integration methods and software. So this is a topic where fast tracks will be accepted, no direct to phase twos. It's 225 for nine months, 1.5 million for two years. Um, the important key points on this phase one deliverables are that you're going to develop database formats to su that support the import and export of individual data sets from various metabolomic um, technologies and laboratory platforms. Uh, you're going to provide wireframes and workflows for the graphical user interfaces, and we expect to have a functional prototype at the end of phase one. You can see the full deliverables for phase two at, at our website. I will make a note here that NCI can provide a data set of blood samples that were run on three metabolomic platforms for you to, to validate your system. Next slide. This is topic 342, validation of mobile technologies for clinical assessment, monitoring, and intervention. This is a direct to phase two topic, phase one proposals will not be accepted, and fast track proposals will not be accepted. The total um, award amount for a phase two, so this is in, in error here, there's no phase one, but it's 1.5 million for the two year direct to phase two. So this topic is not intended to support the development of new technology. We expect that you will have a working prototype at a minimum of your functional technology and that you may have some additional work to develop the tool, the beta version that will then be validated in this phase two project. I, shall, I will note that NCI will be checking the application for responsiveness to the direct to phase two requirements and that no SBI, no prior SBIR or STTR funds can be used for the phase one equivalent work. If that is determined, the proposal will be rejected and will not be reviewed. Next slide. So this is topic 343, an electronic platform for cognitive assessment in cancer patients. In this case, we will accept phase uh, fast track proposals and phase ones on no direct to phase twos. So this is to develop a software tool to um, detect subtle cognitive changes associated uh, with, with cancer patients and with patients undergoing cancer treatment. Um, and again, for phase one, we expect at the end of the nine month period that you will have developed a functional prototype system. Again, you can review the full phase one and phase two deliverables in the RFP or that follow that quick link to NCI's website. Next slide. Topic 344, Technologies for Differential Isolation of Exosomes and Oncosomes. There is a mistake here in the budget, so we will accept Phase 1s at $300,000 budget for nine months and Phase 2 at $2 million for two years, not $3 million. That's an error. Uh, again, fast track proposals for this topic will not be accepted and direct to Phase 2 proposals will not be accepted. So that we expect for this topic that you develop a technology that can differentially isolate exosomes from, from oncosomes and that you would, would have a technology that can um, deal with these distinct uh, preparations in, in a way that they are um, in sufficient quantity for downstream analysis. Again, you can read the full description of the phase one and phase two deliverables at, in the RFP. Next slide. This is topic 345, predictive biomarkers of adverse reaction to radiation treatment. In this case, we are allowing uh, phase one and fast track. Uh, direct to phase twos will not be accepted. These budget numbers are correct, 300,000 for phase one and two million for phase two for two years. With this phase one, we, we will allow you to go up to 12 months for that period. Um, so basically the goal here is to, to validate simple cost-effective biomarkers that really will differentiate uh, patients in terms of their radiation sensitivity. And this is to help with treatment planning prior to radiation therapy. Again, I'm going to direct you to the RFP so that you can review carefully the phase one and the phase two uh, activities and deliverables. Next slide, please. This is topic 
346, Molecularly Targeted Radiation Therapy for Cancer Treatment. Again, we will allow uh, Phase 1s and Fast Tracks. This is the correct budget number, 300,000 for Phase 1 for nine months, and 2 million for Phase 2 for two years. Um, and Fast Tracks will be accepted, direct to Phase 2s will not be accepted. So this is the goal here is to develop and commercialize a targeted radiation um, therapy techniques that could shorten the treatment cycles and reduce the toxicity to normal tissues. At the end of phase one, we expect you to have done proof of concept small animal studies to really demonstrate that you get an improved therapeutic efficacy. And I'm going to direct you um, onto the, the, again, the RFP to see the full requirements for the activities of phase one and phase two. And actually, at this point, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Franco to move on to the next topic. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have one more. Topic 347. This is entitled Signal Amplification to Enable Atomolar Quantitation of slot in Slide-Based or ELISA Biomarker Immunoassays. These budget numbers are correct. 225,000 for a phase one for six months and 1.5 million for two years for a phase two. We will accept fast track proposals. Direct to phase two proposals will not be accepted. So basically the goal here is to incorporate signal amplification methods into a quantitative ELISA or, or slide-based IFA immunohistochemistry assay to detect low abundance but high value cancer biomarkers. Again, I'm going to direct you to the RFP to, to look in detail and be careful when you look at, at the detail we're looking for in the phase one activities and deliver, deliverables for both phase one and phase two if you choose to submit a fast track. Um, so at this point, next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. Hi, thanks. So topic 348 is for um, developing a technology that enables uh, identification and capture of uh, tumor cells from frozen solid tumor biopsies that allow for at least 50% enrichment uh, of tumor cells above background stromal cells. So the budget for phase one is 300,000 over nine months and phase two, two million over two years. Fast track proposals and phase one proposals will be accepted, no direct to phase two. Uh, the key deliverables are to develop the method to identify and capture viable uh, tumor cells from at least two solid tumor types while maintaining the frozen state of the specimen. Uh, offerers should be able to demonstrate that at least one labile protein biomarker of interest to the NCI is uh, preserved and need to have the device and method independently tested. Again, refer to the RFP for further details. Next slide. Topic 349 uh, is for developing reagents and a method for an antibody-based proximity assay for highly sensitive and quantitative detection of high-value cancer biomarkers uh, from tumor sections. So the key in this uh, contract topic is to that the technology will retain the spatial information uh, present in tumor sections. Uh, proximity-based techniques can include things like FRET or radiofrequency tags. And the key deliverables are that the offerer needs to develop antibody pairs for at least two high-value biomarkers in phase one and have this assay and their reagents independently verified and tested. Uh, again, refer to, oh, sorry. Uh, this project, this contract topic allows for a phase one budget of 300,000 over six months and the phase two, two million over two years. Phase one and fast track are allowed. Direct to phase two is not allowed. Uh, next slide. Uh, topic 350 is for um, novel chemical probes or biosensors that allow for quantitative measurements of redox effector dynamics in biological systems, preferably living cells or also in vivo animal models. Um, for phase one, the budget is 225,000 over nine months, and phase two, 1.5 million over two years. Fast track proposals are accepted along with phase one. But again, no direct to phase two proposals for this topic. Uh, the key deliverables are to develop and characterize a redox uh, probe or biosensor and demonstrate its feasibility in uh, live cells or an animal model. And ideally, these techniques should involve minimal, minimally invasive perturbation of the system. Again, refer to the 
uh, our website and the RFP for further details. Um, did I do the budget? No, sorry. Phase one budget is 225,000 over nine months and 1.5 million over two years for phase two. Um, okay, next slide. Topic 351 is modulating the microbiome to improve the efficacy of cancer therapeutics. Phase one budget is 300,000 over nine months. Phase two, two million over two years. Uh, for this topic, only phase one proposals are accepted. No fast tracks and no direct phase two. Uh, the key goal of this project, uh, of this contract, is um, to develop uh, new technologies to modulate uh, the gastrointestinal microbiota in a way that enhances the therapeutic efficacy of an existing or novel cancer therapeutic and that it or reduces a side effect associated with this therapy. Uh, the purpose of this topic is not to look for characterization of the microbiome or for standalone therapeutics. The offerers need to define the microbial, microbial activity or interaction that is um, underlying uh, an effect on therapeutic efficacy and to develop a targeted uh, intervention strategy uh, that will improve uh, outcomes. Um, at the end of phase one, you should have an in vivo proof of concept model. Uh, and again, refer to the RFP for further details. Uh, next topic is 352 for cell and animal-based models to advance cancer health disparity research. The phase one budget for this is 225,000 over nine months, phase two, 1.5 million over two years. Only phase one proposals will be accepted for this contract topic. No fast track, no direct phase two. The goal is to develop uh, models uh, relevant to uh, cancer-related health disparities between different racial or ethnic groups. And these can take the form of either cancer cell lines or primary cells from different racial or ethnic groups, uh, patient-derived xenograft models, or genetically engineered models. Um, again, refer to the RFP for further details. Next slide, topic 353 is for cell-free nucleic acid-based assay development for cancer diagnosis. The phase one budget is 300,000 over six months, phase two, two million for over two years. Uh, phase one and fast track proposals will be accepted, not direct to phase two. And again, the goal is to develop a cell-free nucleic acid assay for, that can be used for clinical use to evaluate uh, cancer as a cancer diagnostic uh, for determining prognostic indicators and also response to therapy. Offerers should select at least one or a panel of uh, cell-free nucleic acid markers uh, that can be assayed from a sample of choice, and they should uh, demonstrate high reproducibility and uh, accuracy as well as sensitivity and specificity. And they need to be able to show that the assay can distinguish uh, these cancer samples from healthy samples. Again, refer to the RFP for further details. And I believe this is our final topic. Next slide, topic 354, companion diagnostics for cancer immunotherapies. Uh, the budget for phase one is 225,000 over six to nine months. Phase two, 1.5 million over two years. Uh, phase one and fast track proposals will be accepted, but not direct to phase two. And the goal here is to develop diagnostic, uh, companion diagnostic assay that will allow uh, clinicians to d determine whether particular immunotherapy regimens will be safe and effective for individual patients. The key deliverables in phase one are to develop working diagnostic uh, assay for specific cancer immunotherapy regimens, uh, demonstrate the suitability of the test for clinical use, and critically, you should think to note of this, is that all offerers will need to show that they have established a collaboration or partnership with a diagnostic or pharmaceutical company that is actively engaged in a uh, clinical or research uh, project that can provide the relevant clinical trial specimens. That ends our presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Patty and Johnny. For any uh, additional questions about these topics, please submit. Oh, and there we go. Why don't you finish up uh, with uh, the uh, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, I forgot about that slide. Uh, so, as um, Matt mentioned, uh, we unfortunately are not allowed to answer your 
questions on these topics, so please direct any questions you have, especially those that are related to the topics we presented and uh, technical in nature, to Ms. Rosemary Hamill. Her email is shown here. And she will compile the questions for us to then answer, and the, the answers will be posted on the website. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny and Patty. Moving on to the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, or NCATS, we have Lily Portia. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Lily Portia, and I'm the Director of Strategic Alliances here at NCATS, and um, uh, very happy to talk to you about our two contract topics that we have this year. Um, please advance the slide, Matt, for me. Thanks. Um, so the first topic here is the NCATS topic 013. It's the development of stem cell-based assays for high-throughput screening of chemical, chemicals of toxicological concern. It's, um, we anticipate that we would award between two and three of these um, uh, contracts. Uh, phase one budget is up to 225,000 for, for up to 12 months. And for the budget for the phase two is up to 1.5 million for up to two years. For the phase one part of this contract, the goal is to develop um, toxicological related assays in, in some type of homogeneous format. These assays um, are going to be used to test targets, pathways, and cellular phenotypes that are related to any kind of xenobiotic toxicity in, in human cells or IPS-derived cells. For the phase two, we would expect the goal, um, the main goal of the contract to be to miniaturize these assays into a 348 well format, or preferably the 1536, which is what we work here at um, uh, UNCATS using the 1536 well, uh, well plate format. Um, Jeff Schmidt is our uh, point of contact for all contract questions, and uh, this is his email in the event you have any questions. Um, please advance the slide one more time. And our last topic is NCAT's topic 014, which is the development of the smart plate technology. We expect to award up to two to three um, uh, awards to be made under this specific topic. For a phase one, it's up to 225K for up to nine months. Um, a phase two, um, up to 1.5 million for two years. And what I failed to say on the previous um, topic was that we will not be accepting any fast track or direct to phase two. And the same applies for this topic, uh, the smart plate technology topic. For phase one, uh, the key goal here is to develop uh, prototype specifications that transform a regular microtiter plate from being a single use vessel for experiments to becoming one where you can do uh, real-time measurements on uh, data and, and get data on, on the samples that um, are being tested. And the phase two goal, uh, overall goal, would be to develop a prototype using the specifications that are developed in the phase one and to evaluate the features, uh, these features that are developed. Um, so that concludes NCAT's um, um, uh, topics, and I'll throw it back to Matt. Thank you very much, Lily. I'm turning it over now to Jennifer Shi at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Thanks. I'm Jennifer Shi, the Small Business Coordinator for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and I'll be highlighting a few points about our four contract topics in this year's solicitation, but of course, please read the solicitation for all the details. If you have any questions regarding the NHLBI contract topics, please contact John Taylor, the NHLBI contracting officer. If you want to learn about grant funding opportunities or other resources available to innovators working on heart, lung, blood, or sleep technologies, you can visit our website, sign up for the listserv, and follow us on Twitter at NHLBI SBIR. Next slide, please. The goal of NHLBI Topic 94 is to develop a transcatheter cavopulmonary bypass endograft to manage the treatment of children with congenital heart disease, eventually getting to the point of investigational device exemption for first-in-human testing in the United States. Both or Phase 1, Fast Track, and Direct-to-Phase 2 proposals will be accepted. The NHLBI Division of Intramural Research offers, but does not require, to work with awardees 
on performing in vivo proof of principle experiments in swine, as well as to participate in the development of the clinical protocol and perform the clinical trial at no expense to the awardee. Next slide, please. The goal of NHLBI Topic 95 is to develop an active MRI transeptal needle catheter and accessories, getting to the point of an IDE for first in human testing in the United States. Phase one, fast track, and direct to phase two proposals will be accepted. And again here, the NHLBI Division of Intramural Research offers but does not require to work with contractors to provide feedback about design at all stages of development and will test the final deliverable device in vivo in swine. Next slide. The goal of NHLBI Topic 96 is to develop an absorbable scaffold stent for the common congenital heart condition neonatal aortic coarctation with the intention to result in an IDE for first in human testing in the United States. Phase one, fast track, and direct to phase two proposals will all be accepted. And again, here, the NHLBI Division of Intramural Research offers but does not require to work with contractors on performing in vivo proof of principle experiments in swine, as well as to participate in the development of the clinical protocol and perform the clinical trial at no expense to the awardee. Next slide. And finally, the goal of NHLBI Topic 97 is to develop novel, minimally invasive methods for early detection and monitoring of cardiac injury due to cancer therapy-induced cardiotoxicity. Phase 1, fast track, and direct to phase 2 proposals will all be accepted. And those are the four contract topics that are being solicited by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute this year. Please read the full solicitation for more details and contact John Taylor, the contracting officer for NHLBI, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And now I will turn it over to Chelsea at the NIAID to discuss the, their contract topics. Thank you, Matt. My name is Chelsea Lane. I'm one of the SBIR coordinators for the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. NIAID has seven SBR contract topics in the 2016 program solicitation. And as with everybody else, I encourage you to refer to the solicitation for more details. Next slide, please. The first topic, topic 33, focuses on precision genome engineering for HIV eradication. The objective of this topic is to design improved nucleases for disruption of integrated HIV provirus and or essential cellular proteins so HIV replication is no longer supported. Next slide, please. Topic 34 focuses on H or high throughput assay platform for quantifying latent HIV reservoirs. The objective of this topic is to develop innovative approaches to quantify latent replication competent HIV that are more efficient than a viral outgrowth assay. Next slide, please. Topic 35 focuses on a method for the detection of minority populations of drug-resistant HIV. The objective of this topic is to develop inexpensive methods to detect important minor variant mutations causing resistance to each of the antiretroviral drugs. These must be detected in all HIV subtypes, methods that detect a set of relevant point mutations and methods that collect full sequences are both acceptable. Next slide, please. Topic 36 focuses on simple, inexpensive device to purify DNA from sputum for tuberculosis testing. The objective of this topic is to develop a simple, inexpensive device to purify DNA from sputum for use in a molecular TB diagnostic and drug resistance testing. The purified DNA sample should be compatible with different technologies, thus removing the sample processing step from development of the test. This would also allow the sputum processing to be done at the point of care. Next slide, please. Topic 37 focuses on telemonitoring, telemonitoring for infectious diseases and the development of a remote system for assessing patient parameters and specimen analysis. 
The objective of this topic is to develop a device that can, in a non-clinical setting, monitor and report data on the emergence and progression of an infectious disease. Systems that remotely monitor report physiological status with minimally invasive specimen collection would be critical in informing and supporting the clinical management of disease, for example, premature infants at risk for RSV. Next slide, please. Topic 38 focuses on innovative oral formulations for anti-infective drugs. The objective of this topic is to develop alternative formulations of FDA-approved anti-infective agents for use in children and adults who have difficulty taking traditional tableted drugs. Next slide, please. And this is our last and final topic, topic 39, which focuses on the development of vaccines against pathogens with small market potential. The objective of this topic is to promote the development of vaccines against pathogens with limited market potential. Examples of unmet vaccine needs include valley fever, Lyme disease, and vaccines for selected high-risk populations. Next slide, please. Again, if you have any questions, we encourage you to contact our contracting officer, Charles Jackson, from the Office of Acquisitions at NIAID. And with that, I will turn it back over to Matt Portnoy. Thank you very much, Chelsea. And last but certainly not least, I will turn it over to Sean Griffiths at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to present a brief overview of CDC and their topics. Sean. Thank you, Matt. And as previously stated by my colleagues as well as uh, uh, Dr. Portnoy, um, please, for those who have questions about the topics that CDC has included in the solicitation, see Section 10 where we have listings for our contract um, contracting officers for each of our institutes or centers that have submitted topics in this solicitation. Next slide. CDC's SBIR program is one in which um, is managed out of our Office of the Associate Director for Science. The program works with our centers, institutes, and offices to make determinations of how, as how best our SBIR funds can be used to support high impact SBIR projects, which would overall benefit public health and the agency's scientific mission and priorities. Again, as Dr. Portner had shared early in his uh, presentation, CDC participates in the overall HHS NIH omnibus grant and contract solicitation. We do want to stress that CDC does not participate in the STTR program at this time, but we have opted into the and uh, the majority VC ownership authority as of FY15. And so that's um, listed in the solicitation. And if you have any for, uh, questions or uh, concerns about that, please look for that in the solicitation. Um, as Dr. Portner also mentioned, our budget at this point in time is $7 million approximately for FY15. Next slide. The uniqueness of CDC's SBIR programs around life sciences, as well as CDC's mission around public health, emergency response, which is not only domestic, but international. Our awards, approximately 25 phase ones, up to 150. We do have a cap of $150,000 for our phase ones, and approximately five to six phase twos per year, again, capped at one million each. We broke a little bit down as far as our grants versus contracts. In FY13, we had about 58 or 60 percent grants and 42 percent contracts. And in FY14, 25 percent grants and 75 percent contracts. Next slide, please. We want to take a moment and talk just a bit about CDC's strategic priorities and our key winnable battles to give a frame or a lane in which uh, we we're requesting folks to um, align their pr proposals or applications. CDC strategic priorities are specific in that we um, have one, two, three, four, five. Strategic priorities around strengthening surveillance, epidemiology, laboratory services, improving the ability to support our state, tribal, local, and territorial public health, improving global health impact, as well as increasing the policy impact and better preventing illness, injury, disability, and death. Along that comes our, what we call winnable battles. Next slide, please. And to keep pace with what we call 
emerging public health challenges and to address these leading causes of death and disability, CDC initiated this effort to achieve what we call measurable impact to quickly target a few specific areas. And these areas are CDC's winnable battles. Tobacco, reducing uh, tobacco use, what we call healthcare associated infections, reduction of that, teen pregnancy, reduction of teen pregnancy and associated mortality and morbidity, issues associated with nutrition, physical activity, obesity and food safety, motor vehicle injuries and crashes associated with um, those, and then the issue around HIV and mortality that's associated with HIV infection and AIDS. Those are CDC's winnable battles. Next slide, please. So where does CDC's SBIR program intersect with small business concerns, uh, venture capitalists and entrepreneurs? Because CDC supports this groundbreaking health and medical research and real-time emergency response activities in an effort to keep the United States safe, healthy, and secure, as well as globally, CDC promotes and funds research and development that will support our mission and strategic priorities. Our role is not only local, state, and federal, but also on a global level, as well as you, one can see in the news as our work in West Africa continues. The SBIR program is a way for innovators and entrepreneurs to contribute to making not only the U.S., but the world a healthier, safe, safer place. And so our topics are oriented towards our, both our mission and our strategic priorities and these winnable battles. Next slide, please. We have seven specific topics listed in this solicitation. The first topic is related to our Global Health Center, the Center for Global Health diagnostic tools to support the elimination and control of neglected tropical diseases, one to two anticipated awards, the phase one up to 150,000 for six months. The specific project goal is to have a prototype field compatible test that can address the following issues currently faced by national NTD programs, the need for rapid determination of infection prevalence and support of micromapping, the detection of co-infections that hamper massive drug administration activities, epidemiological surveillance, evaluation of program impact through serological monitoring and surveillance for infection or exposure following apparent interruption of transmission. Next topic, please. This is out of our National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, the Novo Assembly of Arthropod Genomes of Public Health Importance, Number of awards expected is one with a budget of up to 150,000, capped at that for six months. The project goals of the proposed research are to rapidly and cost-effectively assemble high-quality arthropod genomes de novo. The innovation should ultimately enable large numbers of genomes to be assembled in multi-megabase scaffolds rapidly and affordably. A scalable paralyzable approach will enable much broader surveys and targeted studies of arthropod, arthropod genomes to better understand their role in disease transmission and myriad cost to society. Next slide, please. This topic is also from the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Diseases, detecting lower intestinal Microbiome Disruption and Multidrug Resistant Organisms, MDROs. One award expected, up to 150 for phase one. Project goals, develop a proof of concept assay that could be used as a basis of a diagnostic method for stool and quantita that quantitatively detects not only the prevalence or presence and relative amount of one or more of the previously described MDROs, for example, I CRE, VRE, ESBL, and or C. difficile, but also the taxonomic components and diversity of the gut microbiome. The approach to both, this is the second topic, or second uh, goal, the approach to both MDRO detection and microbiome description may utilize a number of different existing technologic platforms and combinations thereof, including but not limited to single or multiplex PCR platforms, 16S ribosomal RNA encoding DNA amplification and sequencing, deep DNA sequencing, or other advanced metagenomic or metabolomic methods. 
Next slide, please. This is out of our uh, National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention, Serologic Measurement of Hepatitis B Virus, Covalently Closed Circular DNA, Number of Awards 1, Phase 1 up to 150 for up to 6 months. The Project Goal. The purpose of this project is to identify a panel of sera from treated and untreated HBV-infected patients, validate and develop an assay for quantitative detect detection of CCC DNA in sera or plasma, establish the performance characteristics of the assay, and establish and validate the CCC DNA detection kit. Phase 1 activities and deliverables include, one, design assay for quantitative detection of HBV CCC DNA in sera or plasma from HBV-infected patients. Two, validate assay and determine sensitivity and specificity using seroconversion panels. Next topic, please. This is also off, out of our National Center for HIV AIDS, viral AIDS, um, viral hepatitis, STD, and TB prevention. Serologic detection and quantification of hepatitis B core antigen. Number of awards one, budget phase one up to 150 for six months. Project goals, identify panel antibodies that have a potential to detect HBV core antigen in clinical samples. Validate and develop a serological assay for quantitative detection of HBV core antigen. Validate the performance characteristics of the assay using commercial panels of serum samples from HBV infected persons. Validate the, the performance characteristics of the assay using the prospectively obtained serum samples from HPV-infected persons and establish protocols to scale up production of validated assay. Next slide, please. This is from our National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, transcutaneous immunization against rotavirus using dissolvable microneedle patch, one award. Phase one up to 150, project goals. The goal of this project is to conduct formulation and process development and a feasibility study to manufacture a dissolving microneedle patch for skin immunization against rotavirus. This program area will provide a small business concern or company with opportunities to apply for necessary funds and work with CDC scientists to further optimize the fabric fabrication process and prepare a dissolving microneedle patch for clinical trials of a patch inactivated rotavirus vaccine. Phase one activities and expected deliverables include, one, develop an outline for the project goals described above, two, develop a draft scalable manufacturing process for a dissolvable or dissolving micro needle patch, including formulation and fabrication of IRV inactivated rotavirus vaccine and necessary assays. Next topic, please. Topic 032, thermal stable dry powder live attenuated influenza vaccine, LAIV, for nasal delivery, also out of our National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Number of awards, one to three, phase one up to 150 for six months. And the project goal of the proposed research is to develop a thermal stable dry powder live attenuated influenza vaccine for nasal delivery as a platform technology and assess immunogenetic following nasal powder vaccination in a ferret model. It is expected that this platform technology of thermal stable dry powder nasal vaccine will be expanded to use for other vaccines. Those are CDC's topics. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, if there are specific questions related to the topics themselves, please contact or, or, or look in the uh, solicitation under section 10 there you'll find our, our contract officials related to the specific um, centers uh, that have the topic areas, and we look forward to um, working with you. Thank you very much. Back to Matt. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Um, as we uh, wrap up here, I'd like to remind everyone, if you have any questions, uh, please send them to the question panel. We'll have time for a few of them, some of which we've answered along the way, and I'll reiterate them. And um, I want to thank all of our speakers today for presenting their material. As a last reminder, the deadline, Friday, October 16th, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, electronic submission using the ECPS system, no paper submissions. 
And finally, this is in general for NIH. If you want to uh, stay in contact with us and find out about what's going on, um, please sign up for our listserv. Sign up for the weekly email listserv from the NIH Guide for Grants and Commons. Follow us on Twitter and go to our website. At this point, I would like to now take some questions and I will go through the question panel. And uh, there's been a bunch of questions about the slides and the presentation. The slides, a recording of this presentation, which includes a recording of the live demo and a written transcript of the presentation will be posted on the NIH SBIR website, sbir.nih.gov. Give us a few days to a week. Um, it should be out and plenty of time for you to take a look at it uh, prior to the deadline. And so you will be able to have, uh, grab the slides and the presentation. Other que and most of the questions so far are about that. The listserv is uh, shown on this slide. And if you're not sure if you're on it, you could send us an email. We have a question about ECPS. To access ECPS, um, who do you log in as, the signing official or the PI? And so uh, first of note, you cannot get to ECPS from the Commons. The ERA Commons, doesn't, there's no link to it. But the link to ECPS is in the slide deck and, of course, within the solicitation. Um, who should um, upload and submit the proposals to the agency should be whomever at your company has the authority to do that. Um, that may be the sign, that certainly would be the signing official, that may be the PI, but the system doesn't validate um, on the type of Commons account. Um, questions about the live demo. There was a question about intellectual property. For contracts, does the company own the intellectual property arising from the work? The answer to that question is yes. Whether it's a contract or a grant, the intellectual property and SBR data rights are afforded to the company as listed under SBR policy. And the question if someone asked, if someone submits to the contract solicitation, can they also submit to the omnibus grant solicitation? And I presume you're asking, can they submit essentially the same project? And the answer to that question is no. Um, we have a language within the contract solicitation saying you cannot uh, do that. And you essentially cannot submit the same um, proposal within the agency under two different solicitations. Uh, the question is, when and how will a contract review proposal reviews be available? I would direct you to section, I believe it's five of the solicitation, which describes the review. And section nine in the solicitation describes the timelines for review and potential awards. A uh, question. Uh, asks, when it says number of anticipated awards one to two, what does that really mean? Well, that, that means that um, essentially what it says that uh, first off, under any topic, the uh, NIH and CDC and the government is, is under no obligation to make any awards. So if we get proposals and they don't do well under technical review, it may be possible to make zero awards. But what it means is that with one to two, that um, should there be technically acceptable proposals, then the agency will make one or two awards, depending on their needs and the quality and the type of proposals for the same topic, I should say. Um, question, what happens if a contract is awarded but the milestones are not reached? Um, I'm sorry about these, um, these, these uh, uh, things coming in from the system. That will be up to the program officer or core in the contracting officer as to what happens if your milestones aren't reached. Can a proposal be submitted by a virtual company with no office or lab space? The answer is yes. Um, however, you, part of the review process will be the facilities and capabilities of the company to carry out the research, which you'll have to describe within your technical proposal. And so you'll certainly want to, if you if you're at the moment don't have space, you're going to want to describe the space you would rent or lease at time of award, and um, in contract negotiations, likely provide proof that you have the space. At this time, I don't see any other questions uh, coming into the system. If you have additional questions we were not able to get to, please send them in to the contracting officer. 
um, listed in Section 10. Uh, question, how many proposals a company can submit each cycle? Um, you can submit um, to as many topics as you wish unique proposals. Is the review process different for contracts than for grant proposals? It, it is essentially the same, but Section 5 describes the review criteria and process. And so uh, with that, I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, thank everyone who attended the webinar. A reminder, the slides and uh, presentation will be posted on the website within a short number of time. Thank you, and have a good day.